Welcome to the Sailing to Success podcast, the show created exclusively for entrepreneurs and small business owners looking for a safe port in the storm of fast-paced business growth. Lindsay Phillips is the founder of Smooth Sailing Online Support, a company dedicated to helping entrepreneurs and small business owners increase customer service, run their business more effectively, and increase their profits. Prepare to be inspired and learn some practical tips and strategies you can use in your business today. And now, welcome your host and captain for this 30-minute excursion, Lindsay Phillips. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Sailing to Success podcast. My name is Lindsay Phillips, and I'm your host and captain for this 30-minute excursion. And uh, as you may know, I am the CEO and founder of Smooth Sailing Online Support. And um, I love growing my business, but I also want to help you grow yours. And I'd love to motivate and inspire you to achieve more obviously boost your profits and grow your business. And I find too, especially with me growing my business, my team is getting bigger and bigger. Um, I'm up to uh, nine on my team right now and um, looking to grow in the next year. And so I find myself and a lot of other entrepreneurs I know, we talk about you know managing employees and, and being a good leader and those kinds of topics. So my guest today is perfect for that. And uh, his name is Scott Love, and he shows managers how to be the boss that nobody will leave, which I love. With over 20 years of empirical research, he gives managers tactical ideas to lead in a way that increases employee retention, reduces turnover, and attracts high achievers, which of course we totally want. He is a successful entrepreneur, a professional keynote speaker, the author of Why They Follow, and he's also a graduate of the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. So thank you so much for joining me, Scott. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. I like the nautical reference. I'm ready to set sail, Captain. <laughs> aye, aye, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what? tell us a little bit about the book and, and maybe what inspired you to write it. Yes, uh, what I'd done, I'd, I'd written a series of articles that were focused on the topic of leadership, mm -hmm. but my whole theme is, well, if you want people to perform, if you want them to work harder, you need to understand why they follow. Totally. And in thinking along those lines, I thought, you know, there's never been a book written quite that way. Let's find out what motivates people to respond and show managers how to get people to give a higher response level. For example, one topic I write about is, is response ratio, that each employee has this invisible response ratio. And if they respect you just because of your authority, they're only going to respond on a scale of one to 10 with the minimum, like a one or a two. But if they respect you as a leader, then they're going to choose to respond in their work product at a higher level, like closer to a nine. And so I thought that idea in itself could solve a lot of problems for companies, just because as you mentioned in the intro, as a head hunter for 20 years, I've had tens of thousands of conversations with professionals okay. and I'm always particularly, yeah, I'm always particularly intrigued when someone says I'm happy here, I'm never going to leave. And what if this could offer you more money or whatever? No, I'm not interested. Why is that? I love it here. Why is that? And then I go deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. and I realize it's, it's because of the relationship with the boss one level up mm -hmm. is what it usually is. So if companies can help that boss be the better leader, they're going to keep their people forever. Nice. And, and, and I guess what ties into there is a understanding why people follow. So is that like what motivates them to perform? Like it's not necessarily that okay. it, it, it shows managers how to lead in a way that's going to choose to increase that person's loyalty. Okay. Uh, it, and just by, by showing managers the different attributes of a leader, mm -hmm. for example, there's one story that I write about where I talk about uh, visiting a relative in a hospice home as he was dying, as he was passing. And, and, I, and I, at, the, at the end of, of that event, which was a bittersweet event, he was in his 90s, I, I walk outside and right next to this Montessori school, Lindsay, is, is a, to, the, to this hospice home is a Montessori school. There's a hospice home right next to a Montessori school. Mm -hmm. And either, it was either because of divine intervention or really bad zoning laws that there was a symbiotic relationship. I, I saw the children run out of the Montessori school 
for recess. They're screaming and yelling. And my first thought was, how dare they be so noisy? Don't they know that there are people grieving over here? And then I looked around the guests in the hospice home, and they're all looking at the children playing. And I realized that there was a symbiotic relationship between these two facilities, and they didn't even know it. And that's the way it is with the manager. The way you behave, Mm -hmm. people are observing you. And you might not be aware of that, but the impact you have is significant, either positively or negatively. That's interesting. And so it's, it's fostering that, uh, and I mean, I don't do it myself, but some people think their employees, like they're just a number, they're there to fulfill a task. So are you saying to foster that relationship further? I'd say find out what motivates that specific employee. Okay. Everybody's motivated by something. True. And for example, if you think back to our psychology classes in college, we learned about Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You remember, you remember that, Lindsay, the, the five Maybe, hierarchy of yeah. needs? <laughs> yeah, at the, at the bottom, we have our basic survival needs for food, clothing, water, shelter. Above that, we have a need to feel safe. Above that, we have a need to belong to a team. Above that, we have a need to be recognized. Our second highest need is to be recognized. And then our highest need is what he calls self-actualization, being motivated to work in a way that matters. So I would recommend the manager, instead of just trying to get to know their people better, try to pick up what are those intrinsic motivators that people bring to work with them every day. Does this person need recognition? Does this person need to belong to a team? Does this person need to really find meaning in what they do? And so by getting to know their people, and I'm not talking about a CEO getting to know 3,000 people. I'm talking about a mid-level manager knowing a team of nine and getting to know them and knowing what motivates them and then also communicating to them in a way that aligns their intrinsic motivations with the mission of the team. And that's what takes some discovery. It takes some finessing and good listening skills and good communication skills. So, th- so kind of in a nutshell, those are the, those are the top recommendations I'd recommend to a manager that wants to foster that type of loyalty. Gotcha. And, and I mean, there's so many different types of companies and you, you just kind of intimated towards the CEO having 3000 people. So who mm-hmm. would you say this book is geared towards? Cause I mean, there's teams that are like me and I've got a virtual team of nine. I mean, there's so many different types. Does it kind of cover the whole range? It's not a CEO level book. This is a book written for normal people, the (laughs) mid-level, junior level, senior level manager. It's not written to superheroes. It's written to people that are flawed and imperfect like you and me that lead small teams. And we know that we've got the pressures of running a small business. We have to get results. And we know that our team, eh, they're just not doing what they could do. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's written to that manager that might have, you know, and I think, well, if I'd renamed my book, I would have probably called it how to get employees to work harder, but nobody would have believed it. You know, nobody, <laughs> nobody would buy it because yeah, right. Yeah, right. Uh, and, and, and really that's the whole goal of the book is find out why they follow and use that as your focus to lead your team. Perfect. And, and what are good indicators to know that you're not being a good leader or that there is room for improvement within your team? Uh, one of them is looking at the way people leave the company. If you see an excess of people that are leaving, you know that there could be some sort of a problem in management. Uh, I would also recommend looking at the exit interviews. When people leave, if you have an HR department, HR likes to do the exit interviews and really have them even blind if you can have them submitted without the people's names and get real data. That's, that's probably one of the top indicators. Another one is looking at the culture. You know, what's, what's the spirit of the culture like within your company? Uh, Sometimes those are things that are beyond control. I know at one point when I was doing management consulting, there was a company that said, we have a, we want you to do a motivational talk for our company. I said, why is that? I said, well, we're having morale problems. I said, well, what, tell me about what's new and different in your company. They said, uh, a lot of our jobs have disappeared because of international competition. And then I said, I think I know where the morale problems are coming from. You know, I say sometimes there are things that are just beyond control, but I would say day to day, look at the general spirit of the team, look at the trends. If you have a large enough team, you can actually look at the trends of, of, of when people leave and, and use the data to help you make a decision on, on how you can get better. And they're really good tips. 
can you also, is there a way to get feedback from your team on like how you're doing or, cause sometimes you don't, and especially for me, Scott, and like, like I don't see people face to face. So it's hard to read their body language or what they're feeling or thinking or doing. Mm -hmm. How can you gauge your team culture or can we just ask them how they feel about X, Y, Z? Well, the problem with that is the same answer that my wife is always going to get when she asks me, how does this dress make me look? <laughs> it makes you look beautiful. Fair enough. And so I, I don't think you're going to get the accurate answer. I think a better question would be something like this. What can I do to help you make your job easier? Okay. What can I do that can help you achieve more of what you want? So I would recommend instead of looking at how we need to grow, right. focus on how we can help them perform better. And I know we all think, Oh, is it me? What did I do? You know, why, you know, is it me? How can I get better? And I, I think, I think if you, if you go down that, uh, that path, I, I don't think it's going to be the most productive line of thought. Okay. I, I think acknowledge that you need to grow. Uh, sometimes leadership coaches, I'm, I'm not a leadership coach, but I know a lot of people that do that type of work that they can really get into the, the scenarios that are going on and give direct feedback uh, or somebody that is a coworker that sees you managing the meetings that sees you with the team. That's where you're going to get better feedback rather than from your subordinate employees, because, well, if I tell you how bad you are, you're going to fire me. So I'm going to tell you everything's great. Yeah. Uh, but I, I like the idea of what you talk about, you know, how can we develop self-awareness? And, and I think self-awareness is a key attribute of an effective leader uh, of knowing that the things that I do, the things that I say, the emotions that are coming out of me at this point affect other people. And they observe that and they make a judgment based on the quality of a leader. And that affects their response ratio on a scale of one to 10. How much enthusiasm am I going to give to accomplishing this goal? Yeah. So I think, uh, I think the question you ask is, is, is great because how do we grow in our self-awareness? But I don't think the resource of our employees will be an effective place to find those answers. Gotcha. And I like your approach. And it's kind of like you're letting them know that you want to improve things for them, that you ma they matter to you. Um, Absolutely right. Yeah. 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 That approach. Now, you talk about the first cardinal rule of human behavior. Um, is that that wanting recognition? I think it's, it, that's a part of it, but I think in general terms, kind of backing up a little bit more, whenever I, I give talks to companies or trade associations, I'll talk about the first cardinal rule of human behavior is that people are going to do what's in their own best interest. Uh -huh. And when they come to work every day, they're not coming to work for the boss. They're coming to work for themselves. Right. So professionally, as I mentioned, I've done recruiting and I, I recruit currently for the last six years, I recruit partners for big law firms in Washington and New York. So I deal with, with the sophisticated market mm -hmm. and I'm dealing with sophisticated people. And sometimes the leadership of these very fancy firms, they don't understand that it's not about you. It's about that right. perspective part that has that portable book of business. We have to put ourselves in that person's shoes and look at how is this move going to benefit that person on a personal and an emotional level. And that's where we need to think when we're looking at our employees, how is this uh, situation going to affect my employee on a personal and an emotional level? And when you think of it at that level, that's where you start getting the loyalty because the loyalty is not a matter of performance. It's a matter of heart. It's a matter of commitment. Nice. So I think that's kind of where managers need to start thinking is People are coming to work every day for themselves. Right. When you're recruiting a prospective candidate for your company, take a step back and ask yourself, how would I feel if I was this person and I had no preconceived ideas about this company? Mm -hmm. How would I feel about this? How can that improve my condition on a personal and an emotional level? And, and I think that's a good place to start, to start thinking about the other person, you know, the, the, what's in it for them when they join your company, when it's, what's in it for them as to why they should stay there. And it's funny because we think that way when it comes to like leads and prospects, you know, what's in it for them and fostering that relationship, but we don't necessarily frame it naturally in that way when it comes to employees. Yeah, that's right. And it's interesting. I think of in client development, 
it's easy to keep an existing customer yeah. than to go get a new one, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's the same thing with the workforce, but nobody thinks of it like that. Everybody's focused on recruiting. I mean, I'm in that world of recruiting and I yeah. get that. But once you have people on board and if they leave, you've lost so much. You've lost history. You've lost continuity. You've lost people that hold political capital that can help get the job done. And you've lost this huge resource of goodwill. I always say that, and I talk about this a lot when I speak at, at conferences, I say that there's this invisible bank account that you have with your employees, with your clients, even your own family members. And you only can go so far in terms of how much you can take out of that account before you're overdrawn. So you always have to look for ways to put deposits in that emotional bank account, such as good job today and say that in front of the whole team yeah. to an employee. You've made a huge deposit in that bank account. And when managers start focusing on how can I put deposits in the bank account today, they're building up this reservoir. And when somebody leaves, they take that bank account with them. They can't get that value back from that. So it's not just about losing someone that can do the job. It's about losing someone that affects everybody else and how they feel about that, especially if you lose someone that's been there for some time. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it's, it's interesting. Everybody focuses on building a winning team, but keeping a winning team mm -hmm. is much harder yet much more valuable yeah. than building a team. You know, once you build it, that's great. Now you got to lead in a way that's going to keep them from leaving. And I know by having made literally tens of thousands of recruiting conversations that there will be people that will turn down opportunities. And it's all about that relationship. Like I said, with the boss, one level up, that's what keeps them there. And not taking for granted that the employee is just naturally going to stay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And then as soon as you say, well, it's funny, it should turn your notice in today because tomorrow we're going to give you a double top secret bonus. But we didn't want to tell you, you know, and now they're trying to give them a counter offer and that's reactive. Yeah. You know, you know instead, if, if people are truly fulfilled, you know, and you look at Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs again, if they're getting what they need, they're not going to look around. Right. And, and, and people, and then we all have heard this, that they join companies, but they leave bosses. Well, that's an easy fix. Teach the managers how to be the boss and nobody's going to leave. Yeah. I love your analogy. That really makes the sink home easier. Thank you. Um, now, as a manager, what are some tactical things that we can do to improve our leadership? I, th I think, re Besides number one, that realize... That was a great tip. Wait, oh, say that again, please. Oh, I was just going to say, your analogy just a minute ago was perfect. I just didn't know if there were oh, thank you. tips. Thank you. But I think what tactical ways can a leader build that leadership? Mm -hmm. Number one, realize that this is intensely personal. That we would all like to say, nothing personal, it's just business. No, it's personal. Right. Because the emotions go home with the employees every night. And guess what? They come to work with them from home every day. And that's just the reality of dealing with human beings. And so, number one, realize this is personal. And number two, because it is personal, because they see how you lead and they observe. And this is something I observed when I was on active duty, when I was a naval officer, when I was, I was uh, 22 years old. I graduate from the Naval Academy, like you mentioned. Here I am. I'm an officer in the Navy, and I go to a ship, and I'm leading sailors. And every Taylor hates two things, officers, and they hate the Navy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what are you going to do? You're going to you, you have to earn their respect yeah. by being a competent professional, by not being overly familiar, by legitimately caring for them, but also holding them accountable and following a standard, a higher standard. And this is what I noticed, Lindsay, that was that the sailors would test junior officers with potentially compromising scenarios. They would say, well, just, sir, just go ahead and fake, falsify the document. Nobody's going to know. And the officers that would hold that higher ground, that would make the hard right decision, they would earn the respect of those sailors and they would get put the deposit in the bank account because the sailors know this person is someone that's, that I can trust. Right. Because I wasn't able to manipulate them, you know, to lie. I know I can trust this person now. I didn't get what I wanted, but at least I know I can trust them. And so I think number one, like I mentioned, it's leadership is intensely personal. Number two, grow in your character to the point that people respect you, that they look up to you. And two points along this line, one of them is write down what your core values are. Yeah. Go home tonight before you go to bed. If you haven't done this, think of what are those things that are most important to you? If you had all the money in the world, all the relationships are perfect, you had all the time in the world, what's left over? It's your core values on a personal level. The second part of that is clarify your life purpose. What is the reason that you're on this planet? What is that reason? Why are you here? 
and put that on paper. And I'm looking at mine that I wrote probably 15 years ago, and it has nothing to do with money, has nothing to do with sales or anything like that. Yeah. But what's that contribution you're going to make in the world? And, and this does two things, Lindsay. It, it helps people get real clarity on what direction they're going in. And secondly, it builds their confidence. Now people will start to respect you more because you're someone that follows that higher calling. I've done this. I did this. I remember the first time I did this at a, at a conference, probably about 150 people in this room. I had a whiteboard up and I said, what are the character qualities of a leader that you would follow to the end of the earth? And I had people get into circles and we, we put them all and everybody came up with the top, t- the top two things. Mm-hmm. Number one is that I can trust them. And number two is that they have clear direction on where they're going. Right. And I don't think anything else counts much beyond that technical competence. Yes. In some ways, but if we can at least get those two things, they're trustworthy and they've got clear direction. So start with the big box on the rocket first. I keep it easy and simple. Focus on those things that you have control over your character and your direction. Start with that. Everything else will follow. Nice. I'm actually in the midst of working on my core values and all that kind of stuff. It's harder than it looks, man. <laughs> yeah, it is. But at least you, you know, it's, it, and I always say, you know, if minimum wasn't good enough, it wouldn't be minimum. You don't have to get it perfect. Okay. You know, just, just get, get something on paper and at least get started on that. And, and, and good for you. Thanks. That's a great start. Yeah. And I really, for me, it's like, I, I want my company and I'm sure other people agree too, but you want your employees to know what your mission is, what your core values are so they can yeah. they know where you're headed. Um, now, is it good to ask them for their feedback on what the core values of a company should be or how involved should we be in that process? I don't think your average employee should be. I think the stakeholders should be okay. at the executive level. I think the top, you know, the core executive team, that's where those decisions really need to be made. Right. You know, the values, visions, and mission of the team. I think, I think executives, they can pay attention to what's our culture. What are those common attributes, those, those shared values that we sense mm-hmm. and we can help that influence it. But I think that's something that really does start at the top. Yeah. And, and I think even along those lines being congruent. So for example, if one of your company's core values is respect, well, how do you talk to people? Do you berate them in the meeting? Do you talk about them when they're not there? Mm-hmm. A, a careless word, a rolling of the eyes, the turning up of the lip, those small gestures, people pick up on that. Totally. So I think it's good, you know, to live, you know, and, and when, when you roll out, these are, our, these are our core values of a company, you are putting yourself in a position of being held accountable. That's true. Because uh, there's a book I wrote, I read, uh, excuse me, a book I read called The Language of Trust, uh, Selling Ideas in a World of Skeptics. And they claimed, and I agree, that 2008 was the end of trust in our country. That at that point, we no longer trusted institutions. When bank executives would fly their private jets to Washington asking for a bailout, Mm-hmm. And all the other things that we observed starting around that time, that's when people stopped trusting corporations, the political system. But I think that is, is following on other areas. So because of that, we've got to be sure that we put ourselves in a position where we can be held accountable yeah. once we talk about what our company's core values are. I never thought of it that way, but yeah, you're right. Good food for thought, Scott. Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> now you talk about this is great. Yeah, I've, I've noticed you've you've interviewed a lot of people. You've you've done a lot of these. Yeah, and I've met so many great people, and I've talked to a couple people on like leadership. But it's funny how everyone has a different way of viewing it, or different feedback, or just different points, different focuses. Um, I find it really interesting. Sure. Sure. And yeah, again, for uh, we were saying before, for me having a team of nine, you know, there's, uh, I, it helps me. And so I love to learn from other people and meet other people. But it's like, if I'm interested, I know other employees out there are thinking the same thing. And, you oh, know, absolutely. Yeah, there's so many, you know, man, whether it's management or, you know, an entrepreneur like myself who has teams, um, especially VAs that are out there. Um, and even, you know what, even serving our clients. I mean, I have clients that have, you know, an actual building and they've got staff and so forth. So it doesn't just affect me. It affects so many. 
Indeed it does. Now, are there any good indicators that, I don't know how to phrase this. I guess when, I know you want to foster the relationship with your team and so forth, but when do you know it's at a point where it's, it's it can't be fostered anymore or it's, you need to kind of part ways? I would, I, would, I would say when you start seeing performance declining to a point that it's just not worth it to keep that employee on anymore, then sometimes you need to have that conversation. Yeah. I think when you start seeing trends, don't just ditch the effort, try to resolve it. Right. There's a, a formula for that when you've got to have that conversation. But this is something I learned from a, a friend and a mentor of mine, Dr. Ken Christian. He wrote a book called Your Own Worst Enemy, uh, talking about overcoming the habits of adult underachievement. And he said, when you have to have that kind of conversation, mm -hmm. talk about the potential first. Right. I see so much potential in you. I know that there exists within you someone that can achieve at a very high level within your job. I feel frustrated when I see that you're not doing that because of this, this, and this. So I wanted to talk with you because I feel like I owe it to you to help you reach that level of performance. What are some ways that we can work together to get you to that state? And I think asking people, I think it's one thing to tell them, this is what you need to do. I think it's one thing else to ask them and to guide them and, you know, almost in a coaching mindset of letting them come up with their own changes. Right. Because if they, t if they say, state it, they own it. Just Socrates, the way Socrates right, right. would teach, he'd ask questions. Yep. The way I think people that are in sales, you know, whenever, whenever I'm selling within my search practice, before I, I pitch a job to a candidate, I tell them, uh, tell me what your ideal situation looks like before I tell you about this. Now I know what their hot buttons are. You know, you know so I, I have, I think, bringing that type of perspective to management, teaching managers how to ask those kind of questions so that the employee can really solve their problems and feel good about staying there. Uh, I think at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, it's all about the emotion. Uh, people come to work because of themselves, because of a certain feeling. They want to feel a part of something. And if you don't believe me, look at every soldier, every service member on active duty they're getting paid less than they would on the outside. They're putting themselves in harm's way. They're going against their own survival instincts because of the emotion of their duty, of their love for their nation. They're going against all the basic primal instincts of survival because of self-actualization, because they see a greater calling and the emotions associated with that are what motivate them. And that's how powerful it really can be. And it's a, it's a simple concept. It's simple to talk about, but in the heat of the moment, that's when the skill of going and doing all the work really comes into, comes into play where a manager really has to think through and sit and have a quiet moment before that kind of conversation and come up with the strategy. How can I harness this person's potential in a way that gets them to want to stay here? So that six months from now, they're not turning their notice. And then I'm having to say, oh, I promise I'll change. And by the way, why don't I give you a nice bonus? You know, who wants to keep that employee? If an employee feels like they've been bought, well, they've been bought, but they're not loyal. And you're going to lose them anyways. It's just a matter of time. I just think it's, you know, for a manager or an owner, you know what result you want, but sometimes it's hard to know how to verbalize that or how to communicate it effectively. And I'm going to have to like transcribe the recording, but your wording of it was like impeccable. Um, how to approach that, that employee. Cause that's part of the problem where the disjuncture is where you don't know what, what to say and how to say it to get the result you need. Um, so that was right. Yeah. Amazing. Great. Um, so how do people get your, your book? I know uh, you've got it on Amazon, I believe. That's right. If you go to my website, it's Scott love, S E O T T L O V E.com. And you can go there and look in the book section. If you can't remember that, just go to leadership at work.com. Oh, that's easy. And you'll be able to find it there and look in the book section and it'll take you to Amazon. 
Perfect. So what's your next book? <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> well, I have one under development with oh, an dear. agent right now. Uh, I can't really talk about that, though. That's but <laughs> it's, it's, it's based on uh, lessons that you learn at a young age that yeah. follow you through adulthood and help contribute to achievement and leadership. Awesome. Well, you have so much insight and just the way you phrase things and your analogies and your insight. Um, yeah. Bang on. It's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. So, um, yeah, so everyone go to scottlove.com for more information there. We'll obviously have the links on our podcast, um, on the show notes, on the website. Um, thank you so much for your insight. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, th thank you, Lindsay. This is great getting to talk with you today. Yeah, I know uh, I've uh, got some actionable steps and thoughts to, for me to improve as well. So I know the entrepreneurs out there will get a lot of good uh, That's good great. to use. Excellent. So, yeah. So perfect folks. So again, that's the end of this episode of sailing to success podcast. You can of course go to my website, which is lindsayphillips.com to listen to this along with my videos and my blogs. And of course, if you are looking for, um, implementable, um, help and support with your business, with your content marketing, you can go to ssonlinesupport.com. So until next time, folks, I wish you all a productive and profitable week and may the winds always be at your back you've been listening to the sailing to success podcast the show created exclusively for entrepreneurs and small business owners looking for a safe port in the storm of fast-paced business growth to make sure you don't miss a single profit boosting show subscribe to this podcast at itunes and www.sailingtosuccesspodcast.com to learn more about how Lindsay and her team can help you increase customer service, run your business more effectively, and increase your profits, go to www.ssonlinesupport.com. That's www.ssonlinesupport.com. Now go and implement what you've learned and come back next week for more Sailing to Success podcasts.